Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Nicole Zamanzadeh. I'm a Global Insights Analyst from Parent Analytics. I'll be the host today. Go ahead and get comfortable while we give everyone a couple minutes to join us, and then we'll get started. I see you all rolling in. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We're just waiting for everyone to get in and comfortable and ready. We'll get started soon. Welcome. We're holding on a little bit longer. Welcome in everyone. Seeing people coming in still. We're going to wait until a couple minutes past 1130 just to make sure everyone can get in. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited about today, so can't wait to get going. All right, I'm seeing everyone roll in. One more minute. Get your notebooks out, your pens. I don't know if people use that still, but I do. So get ready for Good conversation today. Welcome everyone. We're just about to get started. It's starting to look like everyone is here. I see our CEO Ward is here. Hey Ward, thanks for joining us. All right, well, let me get started by saying how grateful we are to have each of you here. Thank you for being here today. And thank you 
for submitting wonderful questions beforehand. It's so exciting to know that our industry is engaged in this question and aware how incredibly important the topic of diversity and representation is on TV. I wanna give a bit of a heads up and a preview that we've extracted a few themes from your questions to answer, which I'll get to a little bit later today, but now I'll introduce myself. I'm Nicole Zamanzade. I'm a Global Insights Analyst at Pair Analytics and co-lead on the study examining the impact of talent diversity on audience demand for television in collaboration with the Creative Artists Agency. I also wanna introduce my colleague, Samuel, the VP of Marketing, who's here with us today. He'll be available in case you have any questions um, or problems that come up. So hi, Samuel, and thanks for joining us as well. Without further ado, I wanna dive into our webinar. So today's topic uh, is how content can transform diverse audiences into subscribers and as part of our webinar series, Demand Guide to Content in 2021. Today's conversation really has two critical sides. And the first one of which is taking a look at what diversity means and thinking about how it plays a role in unlocking the magic of content. And so this quote really struck me. The diversity is about all of us and about us having to figure out how to walk this world together. And that's something that storytelling has the profound power to do unlike any other tool we have in the human toolbox. But there's another part of the story. And many of us are here today to say, well, we recognize, we wanna to listen to audiences, we want to recognize the value of representation, but how do we size up? How do we recognize and know how big of an opportunity there is within diverse representation and where it stands? How do we test our intuitions? And that's why I love this quote by Kevin Huvane, uh, co-chairman at CAA, who said, we must listen to our audiences. Otherwise we miss out on reaching them by not telling them the stories that they crave. And that's a question we'll answer today. What are the stories they crave? So today's webinar has three parts. I'm gonna start with uh, eagerly sharing the findings from the study I mentioned. Some of the data and insights I'm touching upon today were shared at a high level at MIPCOM, but today we're gonna to get into a little bit more detail and do something that I'm very excited about. Um, I'm in love with numbers, it's what I do all day, but I know that data without insight, without actionability, is really a loss, it's not really information. So I'm really excited that we have part two of the webinar today, which is taking action. Thinking about how the data we have and the insights we found can impact casting, green lighting, acquiring, negotiating, and pitching. And finally, I'll be answering questions that you've provided. As I mentioned, I'll spend a portion of this answering the questions you submitted in advance but I'll also have a portion of time reserved for answering any questions that you submit throughout today's session. So I wanna encourage you to submit, keep yourself engaged. Today's webinar is about interaction, about having a discussion and a conversation about this deeply important and rightfully complex um, topic. So like I said, my colleague Samuel will be here to collect them and then share a select number of questions that we can fit in our time today. We may not be able to answer all the questions today, but I promise you if there's enough material, we will likely answer the overflow of questions in a blog post, post, excuse me, or in another webinar. But I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and I'm grateful for your thoughtfulness in partaking in this conversation today. So let's dive into the study. Our study of TV builds upon one essential premise that we live in an attention economy in which audiences have more options than ever before at the tip of their fingertips. At their fingertips. Uh, it's important to understand now, more than ever before, how do they choose? What are the factors that we can look at that lead to a show resonating with audiences, becoming a hit, becoming the one that they turn to and focus upon? And that's what we call looking at the content genome, the DNA of a show. In today's conversation, we're really looking at a sub-selection of factors that impact a show's success. Specifically, we're looking at 
caste and talent diversity, and specifically within that ethnic and racial diversity. And I wanna pause here to say that diversity involves much more than just looking at caste, um, racial and ethnic diversity. There are many other groups that are essential and critical to this conversation. Today, they're out of scope, but we recognize them and look forward to looking into that and studying diversity beyond this as well. So speaking of the what, how, and why, I wanna back up and tell you the why of what, we, what led us to this study. Why did we study diversity and its impact in TV? Well, first of all, the internet has transformed the way we all engage in content. In fact, it's globalized the ability to engage in content around the world. And so while that happens on the global stage, within the US, we've seen changing demographics such that the population is becoming increasingly non-white or diverse. This is especially true among younger demographics. And the TV industry is faced with the reality that by 2045, estimates say, the majority of the US population will be diverse. But it's not just audiences that matter. In fact, it's actually shifts in our culture. Demand for racial and ethnic equity and representation and opportunity are growing, not only amongst audiences, not only in the US, but around the world. In fact, this last summer's Black Lives Matter movement took a hold of every corner of the globe. And so we have to take account the changes in the culture in the stories that people are craving and listen to those demands, both within our industry and from our audiences. And this study is in recognition that there's a rich ta tapestry and history of understanding diversity and representation in TV. At least we can date back to 1999 when the NAACP president called for boycotting actually broadcast premieres because they lacked any minority talent. And since then, at least 11 years afterwards, organizations like GLAAD UCLA and USC have taken upon themselves to hold the industry accountable to provide information about the representation that's being provided in our favorite stories. So when we looked at this, we said, where can we contribute? How do we put our support, put what we can do best and continue this movement, continue this important question in our industry? And so we looked to our partner, CAA, which had recently done a study within film, looking at the impact of diversity on box office returns. And we said, yes, that's it. Previous studies have looked at the percentage of representation in content, but we can contribute by investigating the impact on success. So let's focus on the central question here. The purpose of our study was to understand, do audiences want to see themselves represented in the stories they consume? And even deeper, is the diversity of the talent of the cast playing our favorite characters essential or an, a factor that impacts the connection and engagement we feel with that content? So to answer this question, we had to look at two sides of the coin. One of which is, well, what are audiences getting? How much can we look at the supply of racial and ethnic diversity amongst casts in content today, part one. And then part two, we can go ahead and quantify the popularity, the demand, the success of that content. Let me dive into a few more specifics. Our study included 380 scripted US debuts from 2017 to 2019. I won't go into too much detail here, but I wanna give you a bit of an explanation of why we chose the sample. First, scripted series is where we pick a set of characters, we pick talent that if all goes well, we fall in love with and connect with year over year over year. Think of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and its recent reunion. So the reality is that the main cast gets decided in that first season. And what we wanted to examine is how the industry has changed the 
the number of the supply of diverse shows year over year without getting complacent. So within those 380 scripted debuts, we looked at 5,585 series regular cast members and their ethnicity and race as identified by Variety Insights. Now I'm excited to get to this next part. This to me is the most critical part of any study, which is defining the main variable. And around diversity, there can be, there's been a lot of ambiguity and a lot of vagueness as to what that really means and what that word refers to. And so we wanted to ground it in meaningfulness. And we did that by going back to our central question. Our question was about, are audiences looking to see themselves reflected on screen? Reflected, represented. So we needed to define diversity by representation. And we did so by thinking about the groups that are um, historically underrepresented, which is non-white, generally non-white populations. How do we answer that reflective component? We went and looked at the US census and found that the recent estimate said 40% of the US population is non-white as of 2020. And that was what we used to define diversity. We said to qualify as diverse, a title, title series regular cast must, must at least, excuse me, I'm excited, must at least be 40% non-white or at least reflective of the percentage of non-whites that are in the US population. Then finally, we define success using what we do day in and day out with demand, which we can use as a standardized metric for comparing shows across distribution platforms. I wanna get into a little bit more detail about that now. Demand quantifies attention holistically, which we said is the premise of our study. And today we can engage digitally with content in so many ways. That includes viewing and watching, but I can connect with characters via memes. I can speak with talent on Twitter that's related to my favorite show. I can rewatch clips and follow the show online and wait for announcements about the next big season or the next big thing happening, if they're even gonna have a movie or there's so many ways to still be engaged and resonating and interacting with content before, during, and after consuming it. So I'll make this personal and provide an example. I hope you guys are also fans. I am currently rewatching Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is my usual bedtime show. Um, and I'm completely obsessed with the characters. I will be honest that I consider them kind of like friends in my mind. Um, and so I follow the show on Twitter and I actively engage the fandom on Reddit and love reading the most recent theories about what's happening. And I research my, my favorite talent from the show to see what else they're doing and what's coming up in their roster um, and their career. So we recognize that there's all of these new signals of ways to understand how audiences resonate and engage with content. And lots of signals are exciting, but that can also be really complicated. Um, and so we wanted to provide something that made it so that we can really have one metric, one way of understanding this one concept of resonance, right? And the way we did so is by going back to that premise, right? We live in an attention economy, which means that actions that take more attention, that take more energy and effort are stronger signals, more valuable signals of interest in and resonance with content. And so as an example, viewing a show is a stronger, stronger uh, signal of my interest in it than liking it on Facebook. I can, I've liked a lot of shows, I'm not gonna name names that I never ended up really liking um, and never really ended up watching. So we rank these expressions of interest and we extract noise and we combine them into that one metric I was speaking of, which is demand. And this allows us to compare and rank shows across markets, languages and platforms um, through our TV360 monitor and TV360 enterprise products, you can do the same too. But now I want to switch to giving you the findings without further ado. So I'll begin with some high level findings that we can then turn into action. 
When examining the scripted debuts from 2017 to 2019, we looked at the no no number of non-diverse shows first here. We're looking at those that didn't meet the minimum requirement of having 40% cast diversity, 40% series regulars that were non-whites. And we see there's been some growth here, but that growth is less than what we've seen happen with the diverse debuts, those that met the criteria that were reflective of the, for at least reflective of the 40% non-white population in the US. And in fact, they've grown 42% in three years. And in 2019, there were more diverse debuts than non-diverse debuts. It was great news. We've made great progress. So this leaves us with an important question. What happened? What was the return on that investment? How did that impact audiences? Is that what audiences wanted? When we examined the demand for these scripted debuts from 2017 to 2019, we again found that non-diverse debuts have increased their demand, about 54%, but that is only half of the amount of growth we've seen for diverse debuts, which have doubled their demand, surpassing non-diverse debuts in popularity. Beyond that, and what I find most incredible and important to focus on is that the demand for diverse debuts has grown 112%, which is outpacing the supply, which was 42%, its growth was 42%, which is still great. But this means there's a lot of room for opportunity. There's an attention surplus happening for diverse content and there's room for growth. But let's say, and we've seen this happen in our own data set, we've seen the shift in the industry towards wanting to make the biggest hits wanting to focus on those tent poles, those blockbuster shows. And so the question was, well, does talent diversity impact audiences demand in the highest echelon of shows? And the answer is yes. In those high investment tent poles, we see that in 2019, diversity views are outperforming their non-diversity view counterparts and are 46% more in demand. A larger margin that we've seen when we looked at the total population of shows. So we see that diversity matters to audiences and I hope I've convinced you, I hope you're feeling this evidence is, is hard to, to look away from. Um, and it seems that diversity does play a role in some big, in the biggest hits of today's culture. So where do we grow? How do we continue to embrace this opportunity? And one of the ways we can do so is by thinking about where diversity can grow, where we need more representation. And so we've talked thus far about diversity as looking at the conglomerate group of non-whites, um, but we wanted to delve into the subgroups, the racial and ethnic groups in the US and examine where there might be gaps in representation as a way of thinking about opportunities for engaging and bringing in audiences that maybe right now we're not engaging as much as we should. So one of the biggest gaps we found was for Hispanics and Latinos, which are the fastest growing racial and ethnic group in the US population and now make up 18%, which is almost one fifth of the population, but are significantly underrepresented with only 5% of the talent in series regulars from 2017 to 2019. That's one third. So clearly there's room to grow. But this isn't the only way to close the, the gap we're talking about. In fact, to do so, we might wanna reconsider just meeting the 40% minimum. Maybe we need to think about also supporting shows that go far beyond that. And so we revisited our definition of diversity in our study and said, what happens when we're looking at a cast that's a majority non-white, majority diverse? And in this case, we looked at the minimum of 60%. Are these shows niche or do they have mass appeal too? And what we found is that these highly diverse shows have grown even faster than those moderately diverse shows that are between 40 and 60% non-white. 
In fact, they've tripled their demand in the last three years. Again, another signal that there's so much room and opportunity here to be giving audiences what they want. They want diverse content. So who's doing it? Who's taking this on? Who's so far making the move toward diversity? And when we look at the raw numbers of casting diverse talent, we see streamers have made great strides. In fact, they've more than doubled the number of diverse hires they've had in the last three years. Now also doubling the number of hires uh, and casts, uh, diverse talent casted by broadcast and cable. This growth is fantastic. But when we look at this as a percentage of the shows that they have and as a percentage of all the content they create, the story kind of changes and, and perhaps in a surprising way for many, which is to say that broadcast has been ahead and remains ahead in its content diversity. Having above 44% diverse shows year over year, way above anybody else. When we look at cable, we're seeing, yeah, they don't lag that far behind, but in fact, we can see a bit of a decline here over the last three years, a stagnation. And while streamers have increased 9% in the percentage of shows that are diverse, they still lag behind broadcast. So that is to say that everyone has room for growth. Everyone has room to, to bring in more diverse people. All right, now let's dive into that part I've been really excited about, which is the taking action portion. The first thing I wanna focus on is that the evidence is really clear. Tent poles are diverse. To be successful, to have the most successful TV series today, those shows are reflective of the diversity of their audiences. To maximize the demand for a title, to make it a breakthrough hit, Cast diversity must be considered. And this means that diverse cast shows are not niche. They are the mass appeal. They are what, what becomes the, the show of the year. And to give you more evidence for why that matters is, is we've seen this in our data sets that tentpole demand predicts demands uh, the subscribers for platforms, meaning not only green lighting more content that is meeting that at least 40% minimum, if not more diverse cast that we talked about, which is reflective of the US population, um, but also investing heavily in that content, not considering, considering it as the blockbuster for your platform or channel is really worthwhile. As we can see here, the demand for the temples on Netflix are an indicator of the subscribers it gets quarter over quarter. So we're saying this is valuable as a way to think about new content, as a way to think about a catalog plat a platform's catalog strategy. But we can go beyond that. Let's let's return back to our original thought process, which was that we're looking at the gene, the factor of cast diversity as something that can drive demand, something that can impact whether or not people resonate with content. And we wanted to quantify that. And what we found is that cast diversity is likely to increase the demand for a title. Now that's not to say that you can just throw in diverse casts and that'll make it more popular with audiences. But we're saying that on average, it is people care, people are resonating with shows that represent them, that reflect them. So we can do this, we can use this data now and fuel an analysis that allows us to quantify the value of diversity for your casting calls, for your pitches and negotiations. So that means for the script on your desk or the show that you're, you're aiming to sell to a distributor, we can really extract the fit and the value added to that platform of the demand generated by the show and its genes in this case, including the diversity of the cast. 
So I've shown you a little bit of a visual here that's looking at how we can get a metric of expected demand. And the example we're looking at here is of Euphoria, which is the most in-demand diverse show at release on cable in the last three years. And the show for which Zendaya landed best lead actress in a drama for got an Emmy, making her the youngest to win that award. And we've broken down the different genes, the different factors that led to that show's success. And we can include and consider the demand that was generated by cast diversity. So thus far, I've given you a good review of our report, but there's a lot more insight and great information to be found in the full report. So if you haven't already, please download it and read it and, and look into it yourself. But also I feel I've spent today largely giving you these high level overviewing of the industry type of insights. And most of us don't necessarily need to be at that level. In fact, most of us might be most interested in the show level um, and, and examining how demand changes for shows that are diverse and specific. So I wanna go ahead and give you a few examples of that and how you can get more information. And I'll do so with an example, with a few examples. I wanna take us back to late May, early June of 2020 with the Black Lives Movement, which took hold again, not only of the US, but of the world. And at the time we saw this confluence, this impact, the, the relationship between culture, audience, and the magic of content and we saw that people turned to Dear White People and 13th as a source of education and a way to show solidarity with the movement. And this in turn drove demand up 300% for the show. This demand that we saw demonstrates how the resonance that diversity drives embraces the reality that today's content becomes integrated into our lives meaningfully. Viewers are not only consumers, they really take this content in and make it part of their community, part of their life. So this is a stagnant one statistic, but you can get insights like this in real time from markets around the world, and you can use our tool TV360 Monitor to do so. So I wanna take a moment to show you that now. And let me, oh, I forgot to share my screen. I got so excited. Hopefully I am showing you my screen now. It looks like I am, great. Great, okay, so this is what I was talking about with uh, Dear White People and 13th. But like I said, we'll go on to three, TV 360 Monitor. I'm happy to send any of these um, resources that I've talked about and I know my colleague Samuel can also um, later today if anyone wants. So TV360, it's the home for us of a place where you can get demand data across markets, platforms and shows. And it also provides the latest and greatest insights from our demand data generated by our thought leaders here at Parrot Analytics. So you see, we have some of these insights here and we have some shows that you can follow and look into. And I'm gonna use the example we were just talking about, Euphoria, and go ahead and show you what what kinds of insights we can get. So we're looking here at demand for euphoria in Brazil. And we can see that the show's demand has slightly declined, but it's still doing pretty well. Um, you probably got that peak um, still following the Emmys. And we can see here um, the metric of global travelability. I wanna back up for a moment. Um, you could change, I chose Brazil as an example because um, it's a place where the show is very popular. Um, but you could change this to worldwide and to multiple other markets around the world. And we also have an ability to look at um, various state ranges. All right, back to it. So we can look at global travelability as a metric to see where around the world a show is popular outside of its home market. And, you know, I did the silly thing again. Um, we can also look, because we have had time to get used to and examine the, the whole market. I'm just gonna refresh this um, and to look at all the shows that have been coming out. And we've been able to then create a distribution 
get an understanding of what the landscape is like. And what we found here is that we, we know we can set some clear benchmarks. And so in the demand distribution, we compare shows demand to the average market demand. And here Euphoria is clearly in the category of outstanding, having 28.85 times more demand than the average show. And that means it's amongst the 2.7% of shows that make it up there. Quickly, I wanna show you how we can take a look at platform level demand and as well as markets. So I'll go ahead and click on platforms here and it opens up to Netflix, but we have lots of other options. We can look at HBO Max, let's say, and see what its top shows are in the last day. We can also toggle this and find other insights. We can also look at, let's see if I get this to work with me. We can also look at markets. So um, the default right now is the US, but I can go ahead and change that to the United Kingdom. And now I have the top shows in the UK, The Crown taking on um, number one after its newest release on Netflix. But I also wanna show you some of the insights we generate. Today's article and today what we've covered is a study that we, we've most recently done, but um, we release work like this actually regularly. And you can expect that on TV 360 monitor. For, for example, we've examined the demand for LGBTQIA plus diversity in Latin America and Canada. Um, and so we post about that and looked into that here. Um, and I wanna take a moment here because I, I saw a great question about how we may examine demand separately for authentic storytelling and, and authenticity is an ambiguous and big term, but one of the ways we've done so, and this example shows it, so let me make sure it's all on screen, is that we consider the factors that would lead to authentic storytelling. And one of those we say is having diversity at every level of the creative process. So we can look at shows that maybe only had a lead or maybe only had a supporting role or versus those that also had someone behind the scenes, meaning a writer, a producer, or director that was LGBTQIA plus identifying themselves. And we can see the impact, the increase in demand that's caused by having alt levels there. In this case, that adds up to 250%, meaning there's, there is value in greater, even greater value in authenticity. As an exciting upcoming news, I wanna give you an example of a show, um, maybe some of you have heard, Warrior Nun. Um, and, and take this as a moment to talk about how diversity goes beyond doing diversity for diversity's sake, which is to say, um, thinking about the story level uh, and, and thinking about the authenticity. And so we were speaking to the creators recently and they brought up that the topic of Catholicism is a global concept, is a global phenomenon people experience around the world. And so that show, the content, the concept they were looking at called for considering diversity, the diverse range of experiences people have with Catholicism. And I bring up this example partially to also congratulate them and let them know that they are uh, finalists in our Global TV Demand Award um, category. And so uh, for new debut, and that leads me right to this, which is that we're having global, the Global TV Demand Awards, third one as a virtual festival this year, um, February 1st through 5th, 2021. And I hope you join us there and continue engaging us um, and asking questions and talking. Um, I want to mention that today as an incredible uh, as a thank you for engaging with us in this incredibly important topic. We have a special discount um, for you for TV360 Monitor um, for the first month, if you wanna try it out, or for the first whole year, we have a 30% off discount. So uh, Samuel likely may have already posted that or will be posting that in the webinar chat. So please go ahead and click it if you want to activate it. All right, that is all of my pre prepared content and everything that I plan to say on my own today. But um, like I said, I, I've reserved some time to answer a couple of your pre-submitted questions. Um, and then I'll follow this by answering um, 
a select few of the questions that were submitted during today's webinar. So I did see some raised hands and stuff. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get to, to all that good stuff too. Um, the first question I wanna answer, and I loved this question is, the, the question is, is diversity a trend, fashionism, or is it already incorporated into the entertainment industry? And this is a very common question, so thank you for asking it, about how, is this just something we're doing right now? Um, and it, will, it, will it stop being in fashion at some point? And I think on one hand, if you look at the statistical definition of a trend, we have data that is showing a trend. There's a movement towards having diversity in our content and the demand for that has been growing as well. There is a trend towards that. But I think we can take a step back and recognize that is not really this moment in fashion where we see a quick peak in the interest in that and then a decline. We're seeing years and years, decades of calls and uh, for action and cultural shifts and demographic shifts that have led to this moment. So is it a trend in that sense? Yes. Is it just fashion? I would say no. Um, and, and part of the reason I say that is actually um, requires a little explanation because I think if we do diversity for diversity's sake, we just make casts more diverse because we think that's a quick fix to getting more demand and getting audiences on our platform or getting our show through to a distributor, whatever we're currently working on. Quick fixes have short uh, lifespans in terms of how well they work. And so by no means is that what I think the data is really leading us towards. And I think what really is at the heart of this is considering what diversity means to our audiences. And going back to that quote from Kevin Huvane, thinking about how we can listen to them and incorporate their experiences and their needs into our content. And that leads wonderfully into this next question. How do we make the decision-making process in teams more diverse, not just the content. I think this is incredibly important and we're all faced with this. What does it mean to make the organizational changes um, beyond just changing the content? And I think um, just speaking from what we've done here at Para Analytics, we've taken time and had many cultural days to sit down and talk about what that would mean for us. And that included changing our hiring practices, taking a look at what we what we have as our criteria and how we, we go about that. We also included creating space for once people come in to really make diversity part of our regular culture and our communication. So that means it's not just a quota to fill, it's a place that we need to develop and create and work through the tough conversations that, that can come with to make everyone feel heard, present and part of the innovation we're creating. And we find that's what, that's what works, right? We get better ideas, we get more global appeal to what we're doing as we listen to many people's experiences. So that was just a couple of questions um, that were submitted. There were so many, it was hard to pick uh, which to answer, but I wanted to get to those at the very least. And, and, and now I'm gonna take some time to see some of the questions that were submitted mid presentation and um, go ahead and give you some answers there too. So I love this question. Yeah, this, this is something people have, um, have asked. So TV is now made worldwide audiences, is made for worldwide audiences. What is non-US audience demand international for diverse shows? And you know, taking into account that Netflix's audience, for example, is only about one third US and declining rapidly. As we've, we've said, yeah, inter we're growing. This is a global community and, and it's more international than ever before. And I think that um, first I'll say, we've looked into that demand a little bit um, in, in other studies before this. And we have signals and evidence to suggest that the demand we're seeing here in the US um, does reflect outwards to, to, and is actually reflective of what's happening on a global level. Um, so I did see already some evidence for that, but we, we could examine this further and, and we're, we're considering that for future studies to provide a global sense of, you know, what, what's happening on that stage in terms of global releases that are diverse and um, how their global popularity has, has worked. So that's a great question and, and we hope to follow up further with you on that. Um, all right, next question.
This is a great question. Um, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna just be honest and transparent with it that we can only answer this partially today. So this is, um, the question is, have you captured who owns the IP in these shows? Whether the key creatives are also BIPOC? Are they owned by diverse creators uh, and companies? Who is financially benefiting from this audience demand? That's a fantastic and wonderful question. And I think it gets back to also the question about trends, right? If this isn't, um, we have to consider diversity at those multiple levels. And um, in this specific study, we didn't look at the at whether the creators themselves were BIPOC. Um, uh, but I think in other studies, we really want to. That, that's something I think is central to understanding inclusion. This study focused by and large on representation in casting and in talent. Um, but in, in previous studies and in future studies, as, uh, as I'm hoping, um, we have looked at the impact of diversity not only on screen, but also behind the screen. And time and time again, just from the few data points I can think of off the top of my head, and the one that I was showing you for LGBTQIA plus content, um, we see that that is incredibly important to authenticity. And there, that authenticity is really what drives demand. Now, who's financially benefiting from that? I think that's, that's something we, we really need to look at in terms of organizational practices. Um, and, and that's a bit beyond the scope of today, but I'm just grateful that you brought it up because that is incredibly important to be thinking about and, and addressing. So thank you for that question. All right. Let's see if there's any other questions to, to answer coming my way. I'm going to answer a question that was actually pre-submitted because we've got time. We got, how will the coming content drought impact the new remedy drive towards diversity equilibrium? I think that's interesting because I think in the midst that word drought, right, already has this threat to our industry kind of placed in it. And um, I think there's, this is a moment for us and it'll depend on what people do that we can look at this as an opportunity for experimentation to take this moment and say, what have we not done? How can we be creative here? And how can we still challenge ourselves um, in creating and innovating our content? And I, and I don't know if I can say for sure what the impact will be, um, but I, I can say that I think the cultural and audience shifts we're looking at today and the more people are listening and hearing what the data has to say, the more that I imagine that that diversity equilibrium will become kind of a norm and something that we're working through regardless of the content drought to come. So thank you for that great question. This is a great one as well. Um, this is specifically about the study I'm seeing um, that we just talked about. And the question is about diversity and animation. So in our, um, in the findings that we reviewed today, we looked at all scripted content and we included animation in that as well as children's content because we've seen the way that today it's, it's, um, it's really not just who's on screen. We actually follow talent deeply and know the content um, really well because we research who is voicing um, our char favorite characters. And the recent examples with um, Central Parks and I believe Big Mouth really demonstrate that audiences are aware, they're paying attention and they, they recognize that diversity and representation goes beyond just visual sight, but, but the actual voice behind it, the, the historic and personal experience that allows people to fill that role in a way that really resonates with audiences. So that, that's a fantastic question and something we really deeply considered um, in going into the study. So thank you for asking it. I see one last one I'll take. Um, and this one is about the term diversity and what it includes. So today we, in the study we looked at, I, we had a really scoped in definition of diversity, which is really to look at representation that was done um, that existed in the casting of a show. And, and there's so many levels that we could have looked at within there, right? We could look at leads, we can look at supporting roles, um, but, but that wasn't something that was within the scope of this um, because of our central question. But diversity can get reflected and represented in, so, in all the layers of content creation, like we said. So it could be writers and producers as well. Um, 
And beyond that, diversity isn't just racial and ethnic, right? It, when we're talking about diversity, it's about all the various ways that people's experiences in life differ and their stories differ and what they resonate with differ. So that does include LGBTQIA plus communities, women, disabilities, and much more. So I appreciate that question and the chance to, to clarify as well. Well, I think that brings us a little bit past our time. So thank you again for, enjoy, for joining us today. This has been really inspiring and we hope to keep collaborating with you and thinking about the future of our industry and the data that we have to hear today. Ooh, I got excited. And the data that we have here today to help us do so. So keep in touch, feel free to ask questions and we look forward to it. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you. Appreciating the comments. Thanks for joining us.